If you've never tried electronic soldering before, the idea might seem a little scary. But we're gonna punch fear in the face together. I'm about to show you the basics of getting started with electronic soldering. And along the way, I'm gonna teach you how to build this really cool LED light project. And I'll even teach you what all of these things are and why you need to know them. It's time to fire up your iron because we're starting now. Be sure to check the video description for the latest show notes and updates. You'll also find links to products and websites featured in the video. And be sure to stay through the end of the video for bonus tips on dealing with the two most common soldering problems. Here's the parts list for this project. This is the Radio Shack Mesmerizer Kit and it's linked for you in the description. It's a great kit to learn soldering on because it's inexpensive and you get immediate feedback once you're done because if it's soldered correctly, the lights turn on. You'll need a soldering iron and I recommend that you don't buy one of those cheap $10 single temperature soldering irons. Get something respectable like this temperature adjustable soldering iron kit. You'll also need a desoldering iron for correcting the occasional mistake or removing components that you need to replace. You'll also need solder, and in this case I'm going to recommend rosin core solder. It already has the flux mixed in with the solder wire. You'll need a small set of flush cutters in order to trim the leads off of the components once you've soldered them in place. And although it's optional, I'd highly recommend that you grab a small roll of Kapton tape. The stuff is highly heat resistant and will help you hold components in that don't hold themselves in by bending their legs so that you don't burn your hands. And for the cleanup work, you'll need isopropyl alcohol and I'd recommend getting 99% and grab some cotton swabs to dip in that isopropyl alcohol and do the cleanup work. Plug the soldering iron into the control station and plug the control station into the wall. Make sure that cable is seated snugly. Before you turn on the iron, make sure you rest the iron in its sheath. Here's the deal. These irons are going to get well over three times the boiling point of water. They're super hot. For this kind of small electronics project, you can set the soldering iron temperature to around 325 degrees Celsius. This is hot enough to both melt the solder and heat up the solder pad and the component leads that you need to bridge together. Before we install the first component on the board, which will be an LED, let's take a look at what a good solder joint looks like. In this example here, what you see is the iron is applied to one side of the solder pad on the board and the leg coming out of the component, and the solder itself is fed to it on the opposite side. In other words, the goal here is to heat the component leg and the solder pad, not the solder itself. Heat the work, feed the solder. My goal with this video is to show you a single installation of each of the components that go on this board. And that starts with this red LED. Make note that LEDs are polarized. Say for example, the longer leg on the LED is the positive side, and the shorter leg on this LED is the negative side. And you can see these through holes for this LED are marked as positive and negative. The long leg goes to positive, short leg to negative. You can also match up the polarity of an LED by matching the flat side of the LED to the flat side in the circle on the screen on the circuit board. Once you have the LED leads lined up with the through holes, push the LED through. Then on the back side of the board, spread the two leads apart from one another. This will help hold the LED in place while you solder the leads in. Before you start the soldering, and especially with a brand new solder tip, you might find it helpful to do what's called tinning the iron. You just apply a little bit of the solder directly onto the hot tip. This can make it a little easier when it comes time to feed the solder in to your solder pad and your connection leads. Now to solder everything together, just touch the hot iron to the solder pad and component lead on one side and feed the solder in from the other. Then switch to the other lead and repeat the exact same process. Hot iron to the lead and solder pad, solder fed in from the opposite side. Once you have the lead soldered in, you'll need to trim the excess lead from the components. Just lift the leads up, and grab your flush cutters, and trim both of the excess sets of leads away from the board. Now that you've got the LEDs installed, let's turn our attention to the push button. According to the instructions that come with the kit, it says that the push button fits along with the pads and I was only able to get it to fit in one way, so apparently the orientation is pre-established. Once you have the push button inserted, what you'll find on the back is there's no place to bend the legs over to hold it in place because the legs are just barely longer than the through holes. Here's how you deal with that. Flip the board back over, grab a piece of that Kapton tape, and tape the push button down. This tape is highly heat resistant and will hold the push button in place so that you can solder the legs. Just like before, heat the pad and the lead and feed the solder in from the other side. Then flip the board back over and remove the Kapton tape. Next on the list are resistors. Resistors are meant to restrict the flow of electricity through a circuit. The color bars indicate exactly how much resistance they have, and the gold band indicates the tolerance or how accurately the resistor is rated to do its job. 
Resistors are non-polarized, so you can insert them in either direction. But if you want things to look pretty, you can insert them with the color band facing the same direction for each resistor wherever possible. Once it's inserted, just bend the legs to the sides to hold it in place. Then it's just a matter of the same soldering technique. Heat the leg in the pad, feed the solder from the other side. And like before, once your soldering work is done, grab the flush cutters and trim the excess leads from the bottom of the circuit board. Then flip the board back over once you're done. The kit comes with a switch and it's just used to turn the board on and off. Enough said about that. The switch has six legs on it and it's meant to be oriented with the switch facing the outside edge of the board. Just like with the push button, you'll make this job a lot easier if you use some Kapton tape and tape the switch into place. With the switch taped down and secured, flip the board over and you'll have access to the leads and soldering pads. Don't be afraid to rotate the board in order to gain better access to the leads as you do your soldering work. Flip the board over, remove the tape, and the switch is ready to go. With the resistor knocked out, let's install the PIC chip. PIC stands for Programmable Interface Controller, and it's just another way of saying it's a chip that carries out a set of instructions. Take note that the PIC needs to be specifically oriented with the circle on the PIC facing down toward the bottom of the board. The circle indicates where the number one pin on the chip is located. You might also see a notch at the bottom of the chip, which you can match up to the notch silk screened on the board. Once you have the orientation set correctly, insert the chip into the board. As the legs here are short also, you'll probably want to use that Kapton tape and tape it into place. Then flip the board over to access the solder pads and the leads. Just like all the other components, don't be afraid to rotate the board if you need to to get better access. And if you find residual flux laying around on the board where you soldered but it didn't burn completely off, just use a Q-tip and some isopropyl alcohol to clean off the area. Once the PIC is soldered in, flip the board back over and remove the Kapton tape. Surrounding the PIC on this board are three ceramic capacitors. These types of capacitors are normally used to help regulate current as it flows through a system. Just like with resistors, they're non-polarized and can be installed in any direction. Simply insert the two leads from the ceramic capacitor into the two through holes on the board. Then flip the board over and bend the two leads from the capacitor off to the side to hold it in place. Just like with the other components, heat the solder pad and lead on one side and feed the solder in from the other. Generally speaking, you want to try to keep this operation down to about 5 seconds or so. Then bring in the flush cutters and trim the excess lead from both sides of the capacitor. Then flip the board back over and it'll give you the opportunity to inspect your work. Diodes act like a one-way gatekeeper for current. They allow current to flow easily in one direction, but inhibit current from flowing in the opposite direction. Diodes are polarized and can only be installed in one direction. See the black band on this diode? It indicates the direction that current flows out of the diode. And the board indicates where the black band belongs between the two solder pads in the diode location. Insert the two leads from the diode into the two solder through holes with the band facing to the right. Flip the board over, and just like before, you can take these two leads and bend them side to side in order to hold the diode into place. And just like with the other components, heat the work, not the solder. Put the iron on one side with the pad and the lead and feed the solder in from the other side. Bust out the flush cutters and trim the extra lead off of both ends of the diode. Then flip the board back over to check your work. Lovely though this project may be, it won't do squat without electrical power being fed to it. That's where the batteries come in. That battery case that came with your kit actually has two wires that feed underneath through these holes and up to the battery terminals at the solder pads. The fancy name for it is called cord strain relief, but it basically just stops the wires from getting yanked away from the solder pads. Feed the red lead through the left side where the plus is located, and then feed the end of the lead into the solder pad for the battery terminal here. Then repeat this process with the negative lead going through on the right side and into the solder pad. Then flip the board over so that you can solder the two leads in. You don't have to do any solder work where the wires run through the cord strain relief, just solder where the two leads meet the two solder pads. And if you need to do any cleanup work, soak a Q-tip in isopropyl alcohol and just lightly scrub the area to clean up any residual flux or other things that need to be cleaned from your solder work. And if you have any extra lead from the battery wires coming through the solder holes, you can grab the flush cutters and just trim it flush. Just be careful to trim the lead and not the solder itself or you'll be re-soldering the joint. Then flip the board back over and just take a moment to look over your work. Grab four AA batteries and insert them into the battery pack that you just soldered in place on the mesmerizer kit. Then turn on the power switch on the right side of the mesmerizer kit and all six of the LED lights should turn on. If any of the LED lights don't turn on and stay on, 
Go back and check your steps throughout this guide carefully to make sure you haven't missed anything. And before you put the iron away, and as needed, clean the soldering tip with a hard cleaner like this or a wet sponge. And as promised, here are the bonus tips for dealing with two common problems, cold solder joints and bridged solder connections. I've done my best along the way to replicate these problems so that you can see them and see what the solution is. In this case, this is called a cold solder joint. It means the solder did not connect to both the lead and the solder pad. So watch, I'm gonna trim these leads here and what happens is the solder, because it's not connected to both the solder pad and the lead, basically has no connection any longer between the two. This can cause anything between a short connection between the two that works intermittently, or as you'll see in this case, the LED literally falls right out of the circuit board. To prevent this from being a problem, always touch the iron to both the solder pad and to the lead and feed the solder in from the opposite side. And the other common problem you may run into is the bridging of solder between two component legs. This can happen to both beginning and expert solderers. Do you see here how the bottom center and bottom left legs are soldered together? Here's how you fix that. Plug in your desoldering iron, keeping it away from anything you don't want to heat up. Then squeeze the red bulb so it can create suction inside the iron. Place the open tipped end of the desoldering iron onto the lead with the excess solder, then release the red bulb to suction away the solder. Remove the desoldering iron from the lead and you should find that the solder has been removed. Then you can go back in with the iron and solder and repair the solder joint. Now that you've got this mastered, check out this video shown on screen and linked in the description and pinned comment below. Look forward to seeing you there.